All right, Genesis chapter 14. Genesis chapter 14. So look up Paul Potts. America's Got Talent. You'll be able to find it. It's got like, it's got a couple more views than I've got. Like 12 million more than what I have. So maybe I need to sing Nessun Dorma and I'll be famous. <clears throat> huh? Yeah. Genesis chapter 14. Good to have you with us today. Is it supposed to rain really? Got rain coming? Looks, it feels like rain. You could definitely tell that wind was from the south this afternoon and not from the north anymore. So here comes Dixie. Genesis chapter 14. Are you there? Say amen. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, I was going to read a prayer request. Hang on a second. Bunny DeMano sent me this. Um, let me read this here. She says, man, it's a long one. Good morning. Please add our son, our son Barry's family, John and Bunny's son, Barry, his family to the prayer list. Uh, they had a daughter that ran away from home and uh, she lives with a mother who is not saved, ran away over a week ago. Her mother did not report her missing. And when their son, Barry, found out five days later, I would be furious. He was so distraught, he called an investigator to find her. She was located at... Now what happened? She was located at a friend's house and is safe. And we're praying for healing and restoration between Barry and the girl. I won't mention the girl. And that she'll go live with her dad, who is a believer. Um, Barry's ex-wife has so poisoned the children against their dad, it'll take a miracle. But God does miracles. Amen? 17 years old, run away from home. She refuses any contact with the family. Uh, I know this is long, but you might need to know, have an idea of how and what to pray for. So pray for that family. And that's not, uh, we have friends of our ministry, people that follow us, that the devil has attacked their families in similar ways. And I'll tell you this, if you don't believe that sodomites are predatory, let me tell you something different. They are. Um, this family, the sodomites specifically targeted this family because it was a Christian family specifically. And I know it for a fact. So does the, so does the mom and dad. They know that they were targeted specifically because of their testimony. And they ended up, um, with one of the. One of the girls from this family, um, she was preyed upon by different girls until the right one showed up. And they got her. Got her on their side now. She moved out of the house, moved in with her older brother who was in Bible college one day and then a drunkard and a dope user the next day. I know it didn't happen like that, but that's. And so she's moved in with the older brother who will let her go and do anything she wants now. And it's just destroyed that family. It just hurts to see that happen. And the devil's working nonstop day and night to destroy families, to tear them up. Cause that's what he's good at. He is a devourer and when you read what I read the other day out of, what was it, Ezekiel 22, you find out that the preachers are in on it. There is a conspiracy of her prophets, Ezekiel said. And God knows all the, consp all the real true conspiracies. God knows them. Amen. So keep serving the Lord, people. Keep standing strong. And if your own family won't stand with you, then stand alone, but stand. Genesis 14, verse 1. Let's pray. Let's go to prayer for these families, all right? 
Father in heaven, we come before you today. And Lord, we know of so many families, God, that the devil's just torn them to pieces. He is the devourer. He is the one who likes to destroy, kill, steal, lie, deceive. He is, does abominable things. He talks people into doing abominable things. And Father, we just, we just don't need him. Don't need him anymore. Don't want him around anymore. He has destroyed so many homes, so many families. And one of these days, when you come to reign here on this earth, you're going to put him in jail, put him in prison where he belongs. Nobody will then be destroyed. No family will be tore up. No heartaches during those days. And Father, I believe that earth during that time will be as close to heaven as it possibly can get. Lord, we look forward to that day and we, Father, we look forward to your kingdom here on this earth. But while we tarry, Father, help us to be diligent, vigilant. Help us, dear God, to be on our feet, standing. Help us, dear God, to never let go of these commandments and these laws. Help us, dear God, to always stand true for you. If everybody leaves us, if everybody, Lord, in our lives walks away from us, Help us, don't follow them. Don't follow them. If we lose everybody in this world, but gain heaven, it'll be worth it. Lord, just help us, dear God, us men, stand guard over our families. Watch out for them, protect them. Raising our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Help us, dear God, that right there, Lord, is more important than anything else in this world. Lord, just bless us and teach us those things. Teach us how to do it. Teach us how to stand. Teach us how to stand even against our own sins. Lord, just bless your people tonight. Fill us with the goodness of your word. Teach us great and mighty things, Lord. We love you and we trust you. And we ask for your blessing now in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Genesis 14, we have a war. We have a war going on. And... Uh, you're going to find, if you ever want to study giants, Genesis 14 is one of the chapters to study. Because it lists different, there were different tribes of giants that lived during this time. We know that they existed before the flood because the sons of God, the daughters of men. We know they existed also after the flood. Same event happening, sons of God, daughters of men. Uh, we don't know to what extent it happened. The Bible doesn't give us those details. But we know that it happened because the Bible says in Genesis chapter 6 that there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that. When the sons of God came into the daughters of men, they bare children to them. The same became mighty men of old, men of renown. And uh, so, and all you got to do is study every civilization on the planet. They got a giant story. They tell giant stories. They'll tell you giant story after giant story. Uh, it is believed by some that have researched that Quetzalcoatl, I've been, was talking about him last week to watch my broadcast, that he was in fact of the giants. He was tall, red, red headed, bearded, white skinned, which you don't find too much of in South America. It's just not, just not there. And, uh, so there's some who, who believe that, and there were giants, and I don't have a problem believing that they built a lot of that stuff down there that just doesn't seem to be built by humans. How in the world? How in the world did they move those stones? Why would they even want to? Okay? I look at it and I'm going, I ain't moving that. I ain't doing that. That's, there's no way. But that's, that's my theory. Anyway, we know there were giants in these days. In Abram's, Abram's day, Genesis 14 verse 1, it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar. Shinar is Sumeria. It is known or believed that Sumeria had one of the first written languages. Uh, the Sumerian clay tablets that have been brought to light in the last few hundred years. Uh, we don't really know of, of an earlier written language. I don't believe that Abram spoke Sumerian. I believe he spoke Hebrew. That's just a guess of mine, but I believe he did. And, uh, of course, Job obviously lived at about the time that Abram did. 
So I would say also at that time, Hebrew was also a written language at the time that a lot of scholars don't want to admit that. But anyway, Shinar is Sumeria. The Ariok king of Eleazar, or Elassar, Kedar Laomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations. So you have Amraphel, Ariok, Kedar Laomer, and Tidal. Four kings. So what does that indicate to you? Fourth kingdom, possibly, or something similar to that. Verse 2, that these made war with Bera, king of Sodom, with Birsha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, Shemeber, king of Zeboam, and the king of Bela, which is Zoar, five kings. And I want you to notice, he mentioned Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboam. Those four cities were the ones destroyed along with Sodom. It's when the Lord rained fire and brimstone. And so it's not, and it's not too far from this event. It's not, doesn't happen too much later than this event right here. Because we know it was in the days of Abraham. We know it was in the days of Lot. That uh, Lot wanted the uh, well-watered plains of Sodom. He chose that. He was living in Sodom. By the we, we see him moving outside of Sodom. And then by the time we see him again in Genesis 19, he's already moved inside the city of Sodom. Big mistake for him. Big mistake. Because it cost him his sons-in-law. It cost him his wife. Okay? We'll study that a little bit later on. So those four kingdoms... Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboam were all destroyed on the same day that God destroyed Sodom. Then you have um, Zoar, the king of Bela. So you have five nations against four. All these were joined together in the Vale of Siddam, which is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they served Kedo Laomer, and in the thirteenth year, and you can make a note on this, uh, the number 13 seems to be a number related to rebellion. And this is one of the verses that we get it from. So 12 years they served uh, the king of Ketolaomer. In the 13th year, they rebelled. They said, we've had enough of this. In the 14th year came Ketolaomer and the kings that were with him and smote the Rephaims in Ashtaroth Kerneum. Underline that, Rephaims. These were the sons of of Rapha. Rapha was a giant. Okay? Rapha was a giant. Um, and so, it, when it mentions Rephaims, that tells us that these giant men married wives, human wives, and produced offspring. Now, my theory is, and you can see it scripturally, if you, if you look at Og, the king of Bashan, we find that his bed was, what was it, nine cubits? His bed was a bed of iron, it's nine cubits long. That works out about 13 and a half feet. That's a big fella. Bigger than what I'd want to mess with. Okay? So you're talking, stand... Somebody my height on my head and add a couple inches and that's how tall he is. Okay. John, come stand on my head for a minute. Show everybody how, what that looked like. All right. But that's how tall he was. But then since Og married probably a, a human woman, his son isn't as tall as he is. He's inheriting some of the traits of his mother. By the time you get to Goliath, Goliath then is only six cubits and a span, which is the difference of a cubit's of roughly 18 to 20 inches. So you've got 20 inches times three, that's 60 inches. That's what, five feet? You have five foot difference between Goliath and Og, king of Bashan. More than likely, it is because they are marrying human women. The human traits are playing into this. And as the giants are being birthed, they are not growing as tall 
as their fathers were, their predecessors. Now, we don't know. Um, we have Arba, who was uh, the, the head of Kirjath Arba. It was named after him. He seems to be, is Arba or Ar, I can't remember. He seems to be a direct descent of the Son of God, a, a, an angel. Angel marrying a human woman, producing Arba. He seems to be a direct descendant of a spirit, a God. And we don't really have a record of how, how big and tall he was. But you can imagine if by the time we get to Og, Og is not a direct descendant of uh, of a of a god he has an earth an earthly giant father so if you're 13 and a half feet tall at og's time go up probably a couple generations maybe even three i mean that guy could have been 20 feet tall very easily could have been 20 feet tall okay um there's some things i discovered i was doing some research i thought about writing a novel but i don't know but I found out, you know, if you've ever seen some of these stone pyramids in Central and South America, the precision at which the stones were cut, they said, you, and they're laid on top of one another, they said, you can't even fit a piece of paper in there. I found out that supposedly, and I don't believe this part of it, they said Solomon had one. Solomon owned a type of a worm. What was it called? I can't remember what it was called. I got it in my notes. But according to legend, this worm's eyes were used to cut things like stone or iron or anything hard. And you just basically take the worm like a serpent and aim it at it. And whatever it looked at, it cut it for you. Okay. Supposedly Solomon had that, which I don't believe. But then I asked the question, what if? What if these giants had something like that? That would account for how these stones could have been cut because they were cut with a machine of some kind. No copper bronze tools could ever cut these stones and polish them the way they are with the precision. Unnecessary precision, I would say, because they have like some of these stones have as much as eight and nine different sides to them, which is totally unnecessary. And the piece that fits into it, Pete, fits Perfectly. Yes. Yep. I had thought about that verse. Some of those cedars were huge. Okay. The, the cedars of Lebanon were huge. Okay. So anyway. Um, so for any earthly group to destroy these things, it's absolutely amazing. Anyway, he smote the Rephaims and Asheroth carrying them. The Zuzims, another race of giants, the Zuzims. And the Emims, another race of giants in Shava Kiriathayim. The Horites, another race of giants in their Mount Seir unto El Paran, which is by the wilderness. You have one, two, three different groups of giants that were destroyed. They were always the enemies of mankind. And, and, if, and if you didn't want to be ruled by one, you had to kill him. Somehow, some way, you had to kill him. Because with their size, with their massive size, all they would have to do is come out like Goliath did and say, who wants to fight me? And if you don't want to fight him, then he says, then you do what I tell you to do. He's the king. That's how Og got to be king. That's how Sion got to be king. Because they were the biggest guys on the block. All right. Now in verse 7. The Bible says, And they returned and came to En Mishpat, which is Kadesh, Kadesh Barnea, and smote all the country of the Amalekites, and also the Amorites that dwelt in Hazazon Tamar. And there went out the king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, the king of Admon, the king of Zeboam, and the king of Bela, the same as Zoar, and they joined battle with them in the vale of Siddim, with Kedorlaomer, king of Elam, 
with title, king of nations, with Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Ariok, king of, Eli of Elisar, four kings with five. They're battling one another in this valley of, uh, in this, in this particular valley. The Vale of Siddim was full of slime pits. What are slime pits? Green goo from Ghostbusters? He slimed me. What is it? It's oil. Now, something to think about. Uh, a guy started an oil company back in the 90s because he read Genesis 14. And apparently, before God destroyed Sodom, there was an oil field that was so rich in oil, the oil was seeping up to the ground. Slime pits. Right now, to me, and this is a curiosity, Israel is the only Middle Eastern nation that never sells a drop of oil. Do you know why? They don't have any. There are no oil wells in Israel anywhere. In the land of Israel, God, for some reason, gave them the only land that apparently has no oil. Syria has oil. Saudi Arabia has oil. Iran has oil. Iraq has oil. They, uh, Egypt has oil. They are surrounded by these Muslim nations. And they all are rich in oil, but not a drop in the land of Israel. But at some point, and this area basically is the sort of the south. If you look in your maps, you got maps in your Bible? If you look on the map in your Bible, like right here, uh, let's see if I can find one of the Dead Sea or the, yeah, the Dead Sea. Let's see here. Yeah, here's the Dead Sea right here. This is the Dead Sea. This is the River Jordan. And we're talking about somewhere down here, the southwest area of the Dead Sea is where Sodom was. And Sodom, according to this, was a valley full of oil, full of tar, full of slime pits. Okay? So a guy back in the 90s, a Texas oil man, started an oil company. And he, was, he tried drilling... Several different locations, never able to reach oil. I think he finally died and the country went bankrupt or the, the company went bankrupt. But supposedly, there's got to be oil there somewhere. They just haven't reached it yet. Um, imagine that if Israel found the oil that apparently there's so much there, it seeped to the ground. If Israel all of a sudden became an oil nation. Would that start a war? You better believe it. Somebody somewhere would be going, we're going to get that all. Probably the bushes. Anyway, the veil was full of slime pits. The kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there. And they that remained fled to the mountain. And they took of all, all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals. Their, that means their food and they went their way. So... Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboam, and uh, Zoar, they all, or whatever, who was it? Anyway, they lost the battle. And to the victor goes the spoils. So the five nations, or the four nations, beat the five nations. Beat them bad, too. Took all their stuff, all their food, whatever they had, and stole it, and went their way. And they took Lot... Abram's brother's son who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. Now, you're fixing to get God involved. Because Lot wasn't much. But according to the scriptures, he was a righteous man. And you don't mess with God's people and get away with it. Now, don't take that to mean nobody ever messes with God's people and they're not allowed to, so they don't. That's not true. God will wait till they mess with God's people, then he'll get them. And messing with God's people may be God's idea to begin with. Kind of get God's people praying, amen? But you just don't do it and God doesn't do anything about it. He's always going to stand up for his people. Somebody say amen. So in verse 13, 
there came one that had escaped, one of Lot's servants, I believe. There came one that had escaped and told Abram, the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, uh, brother of Eskol and the brother of Aner. And these were confederate with Abram. They, in other words, they were on a Abram's side. And I'm surprised that the Southern uh, Poverty Law Center has not got this word taken out of our Bibles by lawsuit. Confederate. When Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, meaning Lot, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them even to Dan. And he divided himself against them, he and his servants, by night, and smote them and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods, also brought again his brother Lot, and his goods, and the women also, and the people. All it takes is one very upset, dedicated man of God. Somebody say amen. All it takes is a Christian who's, I've had enough. That's all it takes. And God will be on that man's side. Now we're talking about 318 men who have decided to take on an entire army to get back what, belong, what doesn't belong to them. Now you ponder this for a while. God makes things precious to us. He makes things to where we love them and we just not, we're just not going to give them up. And when you've had enough, you go to God and say, God, I'm, I can't take this anymore. That was precious to me. And the devil's, t I, I think I'd rather have it back. What did David do? When a lion came and stole one of the little lambs out of his father's flock. Excuse me, Mr. Lion. I'm sorry, but you're going to have to go live on lizards tonight or something. Because that lamb doesn't happen to belong to you. It belongs to my father. My father put me in charge of it. And I'm not going to go back and tell my father that I lost the lamb. I'd just rather whoop you. Now, you can give me the lamb back if you want. But if you don't. I'm going to smite you and I'm going to take it from you no, no matter what. And it's exactly what he did. Me, I'm going, poor lamb. But all it takes, in some cases, I wouldn't say in every case, but in some cases what it takes is a servant of God who's had enough. And when the devil pounds on you and the devil pounds on you and the devil pounds on you, and he's not letting up. Sometimes you just say, devil, I've had enough. And I ain't going to take no more. And you stand up. Let God empower you. You stand up. And I promise you the devil will flee. Amen. Now in verse 17. This shows you the nature and character of Abraham. Not only was he meek. And God described him that way. In letting Lot decide what part of the land he was going to take. And Abram said, whichever you take, then I'll go the other way. Um, but you see this as well, that he's decided that I'd rather live poor and do without. Rather than somebody say that they made me rich. Look at what he does. The king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Kedorlaomer and of the kings that were with him. What that means is Abraham slew those four kings, killed them. When the five armies couldn't do it, one irate Christian did. Amen. And the kings that were with them at the Valley of Sheba, which is the king's dale. Now, we're going to introduce Melchizedek, but I'm not going to get into him right this minute. Now, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. Remember, I told you to research him and answer the question. Is Melchizedek Jesus? Is Melchizedek Jesus? Did, who did your... I'll find out later who did their homework. So the Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram, of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. 
And blessed be the most high God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand. And he gave him tithes of all. Meaning Abram gave tithes to Melchizedek. Now, this is before Moses and the law. And I've had people argue, get mad. Uh, John Uter told me about a man in his church. John preached on tithing one night. And he said, you're robbing God. He preached it out of Malachi. Will a man rob God? Where have we robbed God? In, in tithes and offerings, God said. God's the one that said that. Well, this man came up to John after church and just, just blew into him. And he, he said, you, you didn't preach that. You're, right. you're not right. You're wrong. You're, you're not. And uh, John said, well, I'm just telling you what the Bible says. You're a robber. And then John went to the book of Revelation and he read off the list of people that don't go to New Jerusalem. Robbers were in the list. The guy didn't like that. So the guy, John, got into it. John was his mailman. He met up with him the next day and they got into it again. And the guy said, well, I bet I know somebody that'll settle this for us, John. John said, who's that? He said, Mike Hoggard. John said, well, let me give you his phone number. You can call him. And this guy called me. I had no idea. <laughs> and I said, I asked the man, I said, well, sir, I said, I don't know you. So I'm just going to ask you this question. I said, do you tithe? Well, I mean, you have to understand, I help my family out a lot. I, you know, I give, I help my daughters along. And I, I said, sir, do you tithe? Well, I, at times I have. I said, the times you didn't, you robbed God. What made him mad? What's in the Old Testament? I said, I don't care what page it's on. Abram gave a voluntary tithe. And it specifically says tithe. That word means tenth. Literally means 10%. This is even before the law. And Abram knew to give a tenth of everything that he had to Melchizedek, the king of Salem. Didn't, doesn't say anywhere here that he owed it to him. Doesn't say anywhere here that it was a commandment. Doesn't say, it, it was eventually later on the law, the commandment. But Abram does this even before the law. What does that tell you? That it is God's way, even without a law, it's still God's way. God says, do it. He gave him tithes of all. So, let me read, I don't have this here, but let's, let's keep reading. Um, let's see here, where do I want to pick this up from? Verse 21, look in your Bible. The king of Sodom said unto Abram, give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. In other words, Abram didn't, didn't just win what was stolen from him. He wanted all back. All the servants, all the food, everything that was stolen by those four kings. Abram got it all back. Everything that the king of Sodom had lost, the king of Gomorrah had lost, the king of Ab, uh, Adma had lost, the king of Zebulun had lost. He got it all back. So he brings it then to the kings. He said, this is your stuff. And look at what the king of Sodom did. The king of Sodom said unto Abram, give me, give me the persons, the servants. You can keep all the stuff. We'll give that to you as a, as a reward. And look at Abram and his character. Abram said to the king of Sodom, I've lift up my hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth. I made a promise. Now you look at this. Did any, did anybody know that Abram made this promise before Abram just spelled it out? No. And what is in our nature that we make a promise to God? You know, they say there's no atheists in foxholes, Chris. So... Maybe a lot of guys got religious when they're out fighting in the field of battle. But then after the battle, not so much. So they decided, well, got, I got through that. Maybe I just got through it on my luck. 
And they're not going to keep the promise they made. God, if you get me out of this, I'll live for you. I'll keep your commandments. God got them through it. They have no intention of doing that. You know why? Well, nobody heard me say that. So in their mind, they're okay with not keeping the oath that they made before God. I don't read anywhere where Abram raised his hand to both side God and said, this is what I'm going to do. But Abram was so great in his character that he decides he's going to keep the oath that he made to God, even though nobody knew that he actually made that oath to God. Now, when you can make a promise to God between you and God alone and keep it on your own without people holding you to it, you've got something in you. And he had it in him. Abram said, verse 22 again, I've lift up my hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet. And that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abram rich. Now, we're not really told why Abram said that, but apparently he didn't want anybody boasting about why he was wealthy. He wanted, apparently it looks to me like, he wanted everybody to know God did this for me. No man did this for me. God did this for me. To him belongs the glory, the honor, the praise, the thanks. That's how I'll do it. And he said, um, I won't take anything. Nobody, nobody's going to say, I made Abram rich. He said, save only that which the young men have eaten and the portion of men which went with me, Aner and Eskol and Mamre, let them take their portion. Other than that, I'm not taking anything. You take it back. You take it back to Sodom with you. That's your stuff. You didn't hire me to go get it. We didn't make an uh, agreement that I was going to get it if I got so much back. I just lost Lot. I lost everything that he had. I went and got it back. By the way, I beat all those guys. I don't know what's wrong with you guys, why you couldn't do it, but I did it. God helped me and to God be the glory. But no man is ever going to say, I made Abram rich. That's character. That's character. And that's why God loved Abram. Part of why God loved Abram. Abram made a promise to God in his heart that he vowed to keep even though nobody knew about it. No one was holding him to it. Nobody would ever accuse him of breaking it because they didn't know about it. But Abram made that promise before God and he kept that promise. And God blessed him as a result of it. So, let's go back here to um, Melchizedek. We have Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. In verse 19, he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand, and he gave him tithes of all. Now, what does it mean when it says king of Salem? That he owns the Salem Tobacco Company. He smokes Salem's. The NASCAR he drives has got Salem sponsorship. What does that mean, King of Salem? So let me, let me get back to this question. Who was Melchizedek? It doesn't tell us in the Bible where he came from. If he had any children. Doesn't tell us who his father was. All of a sudden we just have Melchizedek, king of Salem. And he's a high priest before the Lord. He offers bread and wine. Abram apparently knew who it was. Because he paid tithes to him. So Abram knew something. Knew who this guy was. So who was he? Was he just a king like the king of Sodom? Was he just another guy? Was he an angel? Was he Jesus? So I will entertain your thoughts on it. 
I'll start picking on you if you don't, if you don't answer. Who was he, John? I always thought he was Jesus. So why are you ashamed of it? Well, I'm not. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, but I always okay. So the question I would ask you is, are there other names that Jesus bears? Sure there is, obviously. Uh, Prince of Peace. Everlasting Father. Okay. So it's possible. Okay. Anybody else? Was it an angel? Or was it Jesus himself that, that is making an appearance here? Now, to me, the fascinating thing is, is that we have somebody here who looks like a man. Okay? We have bare minimum, if you don't believe it's Jesus, bare minimum what you have is a high priest... That cannot be a Levite. And why can't he be a Levite? There's only one good reason why this guy cannot be a Levite. Huh? Can't be a Levite. No, you're missing it. Why can't he be a Levite? They weren't born yet. <laughs> you have Abram, Isaac. Jacob, Levi. They weren't born yet. Didn't have none. So, but we are told that Jesus was a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Let me explain that a little bit. Orders, religious orders are usually named after the one who Father, who, who, one who began those orders. The Dominicans in the Catholic Church, a monk by the name of Dominic, uh, started an order of priests in his lifetime. And there were priests that followed him. They were of the order of, so they are Dominican priests. Um, Who's the Jesuit guy? Huh? Okay. Yeah. Okay, you had the Franciscan order named after Francis. This Pope named himself after Francis. Very rare name for a Pope. But Francis started an order of Catholic priests and they were dedicated to something, I don't know, feeding the poor or whatever. So there are Franciscan monks, there are Dominican monks. There are Jesuit priests of uh, Loyola. What was his first name? Anyway, Loyola was his name. Lo Loyola University is named after him. He started an order of priests that were basically like the CIA of the Catholic Church. I mean, these guys are secret agents. They literally are secret agents going into countries to try to turn that country to be in favor of Catholicism, okay? And these, these particular Jesuit priests can disguise themselves as just about anybody under their oath, even pretending, even having a wife and not having to vow celibacy. They, could, celibacy. they can pretend to be anybody they want to be, go undercover in disguise and infiltrate anything they want to. And they have. Okay, there's a book called Secret History of the Jesuits. Look it up and it'll tell you exactly what the Jesuits have been up to. So they they're named usually after their founder. This in this case, they're the Society of Jesus. Okay, the Jesuits. This particular case, and I never thought about this until I, re I was reading a book one time and I went, you know, that's right. Melchizedek, there is an order of priests named after him, the order of Melchizedek. And since there is no mention of Melchizedek, be, number one, he's too old to be a Levite. 
He was born before Levi was ever born, or he was there before Levi was ever born. So he can't be from the Levitical priesthood. But Christ is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. So who is Melchizedek? Then it dawned on me, he is an angel. At least, bare minimum, he is an angel. And then I will ask you this question, it would be dismissed. Are there angels who are priests unto God? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. And, and I'll say this, and you do the study yourself. Every office that you see in the Bible, whether it's prophet, priest, king, bishop, apostle, angel, every office that's in the Bible that either angels hold or men hold, Jesus is the head of every one of them. He is the chief apostle. He is the prophet, the prophet that Moses talked about. He is the king of all kings. He's the chief shepherd, chief bishop. We mentioned that. Uh, he is the angel of the Lord. And that's his, you can see him all throughout the Old Testament showing up as the angel of the Lord. It was the angel of the Lord that was in the bush that was on fire. The, who later identified himself as I am that I am. So we know that that had to be Jesus in there. We know it was. First it says it was the angel of the Lord. Then he says, I am that I am. So it doesn't matter what office it is. Prophet, priest, king, bishop, apostle, you name it. Jesus is the head one of each one of those. Okay. So in this case... Jesus then is mentioned as the high priest of the order of Melchizedek, which means that his priesthood did not originate here on earth. It came from heaven. And next Sunday night, I'll show you, we'll go through the Bible and I'll show you, there are angels who are priests. They act, they, they give attendance to the service of the Lord in heaven. There is an angel in charge of the altar that's in heaven. There are angels who have their wings spread over the Ark of the Covenant, the throne of God. There are angels who do this and angels who do that in the service of the Lord, in the temple of God in heaven. There are angels in there. And you see that seven of them are going to come out with vials of wrath. <gasps> They're fulfilling what God wants them to do. All right, let's stand to our feet. So next Sunday night, We'll look at the order of Melchizedek, according to scripture, and understand a little bit about Jesus then being the high priest of that order. The Jews won't accept Christ being a priest because he wasn't a Levite. Well, God had a reason for that, a good reason. If it's an earthly priesthood, then it's an earthly sacrifice, and that doesn't do anything. Our, we are still in our sins. has to be a heavenly priesthood. Father, we ask you bless your word tonight. Lord, give us the character of Abram. That we make oaths with you. We make promises. And even though no one's heard of those promises no one is a witness or a, can testify to those promises we made we made them with you you're the witness you know we did and father we ask god that you give us the ability the strength of character the strength of heart the strength of mind that if we make an oath with you god that you'll give us the blessing and the ability to keep that oath and Father, at one time or another, all of us have promised you that we'll believe what you said until the day we die. Now, nobody heard us say that. Nobody heard me say that. But Father, you were there the day that I surrendered over to you. When you said to me, Mike, this book is right in everything it says. 
And I said to you, I believe that. And I just did. I believed it right then and there. So, Father, hold us and give us the power, the ability, the strength to hold to the promises that we make with you. Give us the strength then and character to keep promises that we make to people here on this earth as well. Marital promises. Church responsibility promises. That will keep those oaths, will keep those promises by your strength and by your grace. Bless your word tonight. Bless these that have come, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen.